Thank you very much. A very warm welcome on this evening uh, here at ETH in Zurich. I'm very happy to be among you uh, at home, but also here uh, in this uh, place where I studied also like you four or five years, uh, already many years ago, to present to you an important lesson learned or some important lessons learned that I never had been taught at ETH. And that was also the reason why uh, I, together with my colleague who makes a lecture today, uh, went about this question, how to start a startup. At my time, when I studied computer science, uh, in, uh, I, I finished in 1990, uh, n almost nobody started uh, in uh, a startup. So most of them went in corporates uh, or in other uh, areas, and only few of us really had, we hadn't been told how, how you go about it, and also it was kind of difficult most. But some of them, after a couple of years in industry, they came back and they really started and uh, did something uh, for activity. So I pre uh, prepared a presentation which, uh, uh, which I put in two parts. In the first part, I want to show with you the major insights that I have prepared, and I'm doing a lecture about this with Dr. Michael Brandis together, usually in the spring session, how to start a startup, and there we present the lessons learned from 127 IT startups of ETH alumni. In the second part, then, I have selected, according also to your wish, one of the startups. It's Antavi, where we, you see also the logo up there. I'm very happy there that they uh, agreed to come tonight and share with you also their experience about how they went about it. And we try to distill a little bit some do's and don'ts some do's and don'ts that we think that are important in general, not only specific for one company, in general, that you can take home as a valuable take-home message. So first, a couple of words who I am, so that you can understand what my background is uh, when assessing what I'm talking about. I studied computer science, I did an MBA later on, and I'm a so-called multiple entrepreneur. What does a multiple entrepreneur do? Well, he founds company based on skills, based on knowledge that we acquired here and out there in the business world. We try to find pains of customers, either corporates or private pains, and we try to fulfill them by developing solutions which solve the pains of the customers. And I did that in several companies. The first three conversions, Energie Pool Schweiz, Bekau Soft, are companies that I have sold later on. So that's how uh, I, I earned a little bit of money, which I'm now reinvesting in the next uh, companies like Hotel Card, Rebalance, SRM, Minu Energy, and Payrex. And you see that's about my portfolio of six companies um, that I'm no more actively operating in, but I'm on the board, I'm an investor in there, and also typically a minority shareholder in there, because I have teams who have the majority and who go uh, about a specific market with specific solutions. As an investor, which is my second life, basically, uh, after being, uh, having been an entrepreneur by myself, it's always a little bit the question, uh, or you, you cannot sleep as long as the, as the companies don't break even. As, do, as long as they lose money, you always you know, either think that you have to reinvest, or you have to, if you don't want to reinvest, or if you cannot reinvest anymore, then you have to look for more money. And this is always a little bit the threshold. So you're always a little bit stressed. Once you're profitable, once you break even, then it's a little bit more comfortable because then you can decide how fast you want to grow, whether you go a little bit harder or whether you want to take external money to speed up the growth and so on. But then you feel a little bit more freedom. But until the moment where you break even, that's really the stressful phase in probably about every startup. And I'm happy that three of my investors down now they are profitable, but I still have some sleepless lights, and this is basically uh, because of the last two ones, where I always think how we can uh, move on quicker to make them profitable. 
A business angel, this means I'm reinvesting, as I said, in, in good ideas in the future, uh, both in a, a club here in Switzerland, an association called Business Angel Switzerland, and also in a Silicon Valley activity, which is the Mentor Founder Institute of the United States. And finally, I'm a president of the Catholic School in Zurich, which has, but which has less to do with its more social uh, engagement from, from my part. Now, starting about uh, in this lecture, we, I wanted to distill really not only my lessons learned from my startups, but really also from other startups. And many of them have been even much more successful, I mean, money-wise, than, than I was. So I tried to interview each and one of them to, to distill a little bit what, what were the lessons learned, what are the do's and don'ts that you could transfer to the next generation, like you, what they should do and what they shouldn't do. And interestingly enough, some of thoughts that I thought that were true, uh, I found out that they can be considered completely different, and I'm going to show you uh, which way. But before we start, I show you the, the structure. We tried to identify, I think, almost all the IT startups of ETH alumni, and we tried to uh, structure them in a little bit. Huh? And we found out this structure, so you can structure them in a, a companies which have a more technological focus, a functional focus, an industry focus, or a market focus. Techno typically, most of them are in the, in the left part, technological, fo te technological focus, which means that you learn something here at ETH, it's typically top-notch technology. Sometimes it's a little bit risky because in many technologies we are here at ETH 10 years ahead or 20 years ahead. So that can be very risky and very uh, money-wise, very cumbersome until really get to the, to the break-even point. So that's a little bit difficult, so you have to be careful when you really have a technological focus. Most of the startups, but then in the development phase, went to a functional focus or in addition to a functional or an industry focus. What I mean by a functional focus is that if you look at the organization of a company, they're all pretty much organized the same way. You have the value chain, you so they have the purchasing department, you have the production department, you have the sales department, and then you have overhead departments, which is uh, legal, financing, human resources, advertising, what, whatever. Huh? So, and you, if you have the CFO or the COO or the COMO and so on, so if you really focus on a function, then you really use this technology to solve some problems from this, for these corporates in this specific function. And I think the most successful companies that you see, they have really find out how not only to use this technology, but to solve then the problem or the pain of a specific function in this company. If you focus on a function, you can be uh, more variable into the industry. So you can work, you have a solution with, with a certain specific technology for a head of marketing, and you can do that both in pharmacy, as in banking, as in insurance, or in other industries, or you have a, a, a focus in banking, and then you go after different functions. So either way or the other, or even both way, are typically the typ typical development of most of the companies that I, that I have analyzed among these 127. And you see here a little bit the, the technological focus, which is pretty much what, what happened in the world in the IT area. You see the functions of the focus, the industry. And then finally, on the, on the completely right, you have the market platforms. Market platforms means that you don't work basically for a, a corporate company, but you try to bring together on a market platform consumers to consumers or business to consumers or business to businesses or business to business to consumers so that uh, you basically provide a marketplace or a platform where the value of each consumer is not only what you create as a platform, but the more participate in your platform, the higher is the value for each consumer. And this is a very attractive business model, and we have uh, uh, discovered some of, uh, many of them. And why is it attractive? Because if you really manage to be, to be the number one in this marketplace, 
then you really have a high margin and you have a very sustainable margin because uh, it's very difficult for competitors uh, to, to beat that. And so this sustainable profitability, this is something about uh, an important thing and the most successful one really achieved, whether they did it deliberately or by coincidence. Uh, many, many tell you it's a little bit of luck as well, obviously, but you try many things. But if you're looking back, then you realize that most of them have found a way to achieve high margins on a continuous level and platforms is one of uh, uh, possible solutions of it. So this is about uh, the structure of all the 127. Uh, you have later on the link where you can go to the, the list and you have uh, all the names and the lists uh, in there. Now, to the lessons learned, what I tried in the interview with all of these uh, founders to try to filter out uh, now when we focus today on these three questions which I thought would be most interesting uh, to you uh, at this age, at this status, and in your, uh, 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 in your life, in your career, or at the beginning of your career. And this is the first question, how to generate a good business idea. So I asked the people, huh, how was the beginning? What, what was your idea? What were the alternatives? Why did you choose what you have chosen? Was it correct in, you know, looking back? Uh, and, and what would you do differently? What would you recommend to the next generation? How to go about these questions? How to generate good business ideas? And I give you the answer, the summarized answer, what I have been hearing from the entrepreneurs. The next is, once you have generated several business ideas, and it's always good to have several ideas, how to do you evaluate which one is a better one or a, or a worse one? Huh? And finally, once you have selected the one you feel, which you feel best, uh, whether it be during the study or later on uh, during the work life, how do you implement them? What are the key success for why some businesses succeed and why uh, some succeed less and some fail? So these are the three questions I want to, I'm going to answer in the next three slides. So let's start with the how to generate uh, good business ideas. What I've been told most is that usually we learn here at ATH how to become painkiller. So we have a solution, we learn a technology to, and we know everything about this technology, but we know very little about the pains of the world. And pain of the world, your customer, who exactly is your customer? And this is the, the first thing is really to go about to generate the business idea. Don't only look at the technology or what you master, what your skills are, but look at who are the customers, who are the customer segments, that and what pain exactly do they have. And that's the most important. So the better you fi find this match and, better, and, and the better the, the pain is a real pain, and, and I call it also the word pain, I think it's the perfect word. It's not just a need. A pain is much more than a need. Huh? A pain is something which is important, it's uh, urgent, huh? it's uh, convenience sells, it makes something more convenient, you have little alternatives, and you have a huge market. Huh? So these are the pains. So look after these aspects of these pains in different segments. Don't go after everything. We have a tendency, you know, we have a solution and we, you know, everybody, it's so, it's so great, we're so proud about our solution. It sells automatically. Huh? And usually you then experience that it doesn't sell automatically unless you really understand your customer, you have talked to them. And we realized another thing that if you sell, if you make solutions for other IT engineers, then you're at the same time you're the developer, but also the consumer of these solutions. That's why most of the most advanced uh, products are exactly there, where at the same time you're the consumer, the customer, and the developer. But that's very rarely the case. In most of the cases, you are in a different world. You are the, no the knowledge owner, the developer, the solution provider, and the pain is on the other side. So go to learn the pain. So it's no problem to become an entrepreneur. It doesn't have to be immediately after studies. Go into an industry, or if you have a thought, go 
first, discover the world, discover the companies, especially also people after study, they know a little bit the consumer pains, but not really the, 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 the big corporate pains. Huh? So why not go out there, because they have much deeper pockets, pockets than typical, the typical consumer has. So that's, that's where the real pains are and where you can become much quicker successful. So try to find out how to generate business ideas, become sensible about this pairing of pain and painkillers. Whose pain are you actually uh, killing and, uh, and are they do, they create, do you create by this a big value? Are they important for the customer? Are they urgent? Do they have a deadline until they have to get that, that, that problem solved? Uh, is it, does it increase their convenience? Is there no, no alternative? Or, or is the alternative, are your product much better than the alternative? And is there a good market? Voila. So the second question, which uh, I heard many times in the interview is then the, how you go about your product. Or you, you said before in the slides, I haven't mentioned that, you see here, if you think about your product or your solution, then think about also about this, uh, this four or eight or eight piece, the pro, not just the product, the solution, also the pricing, the placement, the promotion, the packaging, the product, so the people, the processes, so the different aspects of, of all what is around the product. And one which is usually misunderstood is the pricing, how important the pricing is. And this is also something which I never learned, nobody told me, neither at the MBA study or at ETH, what is the... What, what is the, what is the connotation of a, of a price. And now we think about costs. And, and the way we feel that it sh you should think about pricing is that on this value axis, if you kind of, kind of quantify the value that you bring to the customer, the customer is always only no wanting to buy from you if the price that he has to pay you is lower than the value. Obviously, because then the difference is the margin, is the benefit that he has. But obviously, you need a price which is much higher than your cost, because that's the earnings. And every company needs earnings huh, to, in order to grow, in order to fulfill the customer, in order to... Also, it's not, it's not always going good, so it, it's, go, it's, it's, it's going to be shaky. So you need to also to, to survive in these shaky times. So your price, and the price, so the price is something which is in, in somewhere in between cost and value. And I only learned lo long later in, in my entrepreneurial life that in reality, if you are in a very competitive market, then obviously the customer makes a competition and then you don't win because you have the highest price, because you, and you have always a competitor which is offering the price exactly at the cost. So even if you win it, you will not gain anything. You're lucky if, you're, if you can barely cover the cost. So that's in a competitive situation. So try to avoid competition. And th there, is a, there is a lecture even which says, you know, uh, competition is for losers. And this is, a this is a complete change of mind. I mean, everywhere in school, we have to compete in football, in everywhere. We have to be good in classes. We get grades, and so we have to be better than others. Huh? But in business, it's not good to be in a competition. Huh? It's, good, it's good to be uh, where you have a kind of uh, protected uh, a customer uh, uh, binding or in a situation where you can really set the price Above cost, obviously, it has to be also below value, otherwise you wouldn't sell, but anywhere be optimal would be 50-50. So have this in mind, and also when evaluating businesses, do you have a chance, is it too competitive, uh, do you have a chance to have, uh, for example, you sell a solution, but then with the service part, the after-sales service, you have a higher margin than at the first time when you sell the solution. I mean, you all know the... the, the uh, the, the examples when you buy a printing machine and then the toner costs much more than the printing machine and, and the capsules of Nestle and all. So there are ma many of such examples. Marketplace is also one business model where you can achieve high margin because once you the number one in a certain niche, then you really have high margin and you have a price above cost. 
So this is an important, almost the, the most important thing to evaluate different business ideas. Where can you achieve sustainable high margins in the long run? And the third one then is what makes startups succeed or fail? And this is yeah, based on the interviews, I have the package which, which you can download uh, afterward in, in, the, in the lecture where you have all the interviewed people uh, which I showed the logo before and many more. Uh, and we have one representative afterwards here who is uh, talking about uh, his, his theories. The successes, they always say, yeah, you need, you need to have a painkiller huh, and not just a nice to have or a pleasing product. Huh? It really has to kill the pains, and the pain really has to be urgent, important uh, for the customer. Second, it has to be better than alternatives, and alternatives not only need means than competitors. The most dangerous alternative for a customer is to do nothing. Hmm? He has a little bit of frame, he has a bit of problem, but it always has been there, so I, I can bear with it another two years. Huh? So the, the most dangerous competitor is always n to do nothing. So why the customer really has to do, and there comes the urgency in, uh, buying Christmas present. You have to have it on the 24th of Christmas, for example. So you have you, if, you, if, if there is a legal obligation, you know, it's sad to hear. I mean, it's a thing, but, but these things sell because then it's really, it, there is not only important, but it's also urgent, and urgency sells much better than, than anything else. Third is the market scalability. So if you really manage not to be in a squeezed in, in a local market, but if you think global and how you can scale up on a global basis, so this is very important. And this has been the most successful companies money-wise or certainly those who could scale on a global basis as well. Sustainably high margin, I already explained with these price mechanisms before. And as important are the, found, are the people behind the ideas. We now talked about, a lot about the solution, the pain, the painkiller. But we as investors, if I look just on the, on the investing part, I much more look not on the solution and the pain, but I look on the team. Huh? Do they fit together? Do they really have the hunger to, to succeed? Do they, do they, uh, do they, are they not uh, falling down after they have a, 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 a mis-success? Or do they find new solutions to the problems that they come for? So this is the team. Because I know the first idea is always uh, is good, and it's, it's good, it's motivating to start, but then you will encounter uh, problems, you will have uh, other issues of, at the customers, and so on. They want something differently that you had in mind, and so on. So how you tackle with that? Huh? That's very important. That's, that's why we look as much as on the idea, we look at the team and the founders themselves. And there it's important. I, th that's one of my, I always th thought that team would, would be outperform single performance. So when I looked carefully about all these 127 startups, are the ones who are led by one founder, are they more successful uh, compared to the other who have two founders? And I thought, you know, the teams that would be better, and I proved wrong. So, and I, then I went into some uh, statistics from, from people who do some more research on that, and there is no evidence. So it can be as successful either if you're alone or if you're two or if you're three. Not too many, but, you know, a, a, a high-performance team. But what you do have, also if you're single, you have to become a team builder. So also your second, your third, your fourth person, whether they are at the same time together with you, whether you are a 50-50 shareholder company, that's not so important. But you have to become a team builder. So you have to, to people have to like to work with you. It's not for you, it's, it's with you in, in one way or, or the other. So that's, in, that's definitely important and uh, compared to uh, if you fail in social skills. Complementary skills important, then passion, stamina, fun uh, is always important, and capable of learning what I said. So if, uh, if you have to do something different for your success, then you have to be able to learn and not to be too stubborn. Uh, and this, to have the skills of to have the passion and stigma and still be learning, that's not always easy where you have to give leeway and where not. 
Mala. So this is a little bit what I wanted uh, to bring to you. I have some further recommended reading for those who are interested. I'm doing this lecture together in the springtime with uh, Mark Michael Brandis. He, I just called him, he said it's the, the, the lecture is called a little bit different next year. Uh, this year it was called Business Cases from Practice. There we go into more details, uh, also more presentations in, in one of the, of the startups. If, uh, I, one, some of the best readings that I had, I, I'm not a reader, I, I hate reading, uh, but uh, some of the best readings I, I still had uh, are, are those two books that I have found. So if you're interested in uh, about hearing business models about very well-known uh, worldwide company in the IT area uh, worldwide. And you have also a YouTube channel uh, of the lecture of Stanford, How to Start a Startup, which is very inspiring on the different aspects of the, of the development phase of a, of a startup. And now I hand over uh, to one of the startups. Um, uh, their name uh, is... Um, Oops, case study. Antavi, voila. And uh, please welcome uh, Ulf Blanke. He was so kind to show up tonight and he will show and share with you his, uh, explain a little bit who he is and what his company does, and then also transfer to you some do's and don'ts uh, from his uh, experience. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, yeah, what a life to spend your time in the auditorium at Friday, but as a techie, I've been doing this for a long, long years now. So um, my name is Ulf Blanke. Um, I was, um, or I am, co-founder of, of Antavi. Together with uh, Sebastian Fesi, he cannot be here tonight. Uh, so what we do is um, we digitize the safety service economy in a very generic way. So we look at um, uh, safety processes, for example, on events, mostly on events like street parade, like Zurifest, and uh, look how we can optimize those, uh, those processes. Um, we founded it in 2015 as an ETH spin-off, so it has been a while. Uh, we've been a while in the market. Um, haven't started in part-time, so we were still researchers at ETH actually till 2018. It's also one of my do's and don'ts. Uh, uh, if you wait too long in part-time, you just, you just slow and uh, you keep ideas rolling until they die maybe too long. Um, and uh, but by now we're actually on we have been on 50 events across Switzerland, managed around 25 million visitors. So people that go to to events, they get managed by um, crowd managers, for example, by the by the police, by first responders like Schutz und Rettung here in, in, in Zurich, and so on. Um, a little bit different to maybe the other startups. Uh, uh, we're still on 100% ownership, so um, uh, we didn't f get any investment um, uh, till yet. So um, we only finance basically through grants or projects. Like uh, we did a lot of servicing, uh, got a more money there, and then we created a product out of there that we then sold to somebody else. So that helps actually a lot in keeping our own company, uh, but it also very stressful because. Uh, the more you bootstrap, so that means the more you do it yourself, uh, the uh, more stress it is, um, and more, 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 more uh, well, more work it takes. Um, yeah, so our backgrounds, so we're techies, Sebastian and me, so we have a single competence in the board or uh, as, as, as the founders. Uh, I have a background in machine learning, was also teaching at ETH quite, quite a lot, so did some research there. And we're always at the intersection between re research and innovation. So also here at ETH, we did research very application-oriented and always wanted to push technology into the market or into, into users um, that could apply them basically um, in, in practice. Um, I also founded another startup in, uh, in New York with a, with a uh, uh, colleague from the U.S., um, and so I, I know also the differences between the EU and, and the US in terms of getting funding and, and valuations and all these things. So this is quite, quite an impressive difference. Now, um, coming to the do's and don'ts. So um, the title is How to Start a Startup. It could also be like How Not to Start a Startup. So there are also a lot of things uh, that we learned that uh, we shouldn't have done that or um, yeah, maybe next time we should do something different. 
So the first thing we were certainly um, uh, did wrong, like listening to just a single customer. So because we were servicing a single customer, so you wanted a certain thing, so we service that customer. But before st you start implementing, it's actually a good idea to ask other potential customers to actually maybe they want something similar. So you get one customer to pay for it and maybe resell it to someone else. And then you can also make a deal with the first customer, get a haircut or something like this, and then basically um, get the license to, to resell it to s someone else. So so this is always something to consider, especially if we start as a, as a servicing company or, or like freelancing to, to certain companies before starting a product of its own. The second thing is, and I think there we're still doing something wrong, so start small, stay small. Um, uh, you can do that. Um, um, uh, sorry, start small, uh, start local. So you should do that <laughs> because... Um, it's just more expensive to roll out internationally. You need a salesperson in every country and so on, especially from Europe. It's very difficult. You have different languages, different regulations, and so on. But you shouldn't stay small or stay local. So you need to have a plan to go international and then at the end of the day, of course, to grow the company. Um, and one important thing I also discussed a lot with my American friend, learn on someone else's dime. So before starting your company, you... Um, as as um, uh, Willie said already, you need a competence to, to start to base your startup on. So that competence has to be really, really good, um, and you have to be very proficient from day one. Because as soon as you start a startup, you're not enrolled and you're not employed by what, someone else. You're employed by yourself, and the, the, the clock is ticking. So you gotta you gotta start start running. Um, the other thing is starting late. So uh, don't stay in a job too long to learn on somebody else's dime. So um, but um, start early as you can. So, I mean, and I'm talking lifetime. Uh, like, if you're in, you're in your 30s and in your 40s, of course you can still do your startup, but it's going to be more difficult. You have uh, much more roles to fulfill, maybe you have family, uh, maybe you have uh, also a different kind of lifestyle and so on. So it's going to be going very, very, very harder uh, the older you get. And one thing that's very important to me to tell you is like uh, to listening to advice and distinguishing from opinions. So you get a lot of opinions because everybody knows something. Everybody has an intuition on, on, on things that how they should work. Um, but usually it's an opinion and it's not well grounded um, and it can distract you quite a bit from uh, actually um, making the right decisions. Uh, so you have to find a person very, caref uh, very carefully that, that give the right advice. And the best is, if you have a startup, try to find advisors that are really, really close to your startup in terms of um, uh, technology, in terms of uh, business model, and so on. They have to be really close, and the better the advice will be. That was our, um, our experience. And one is a bit of a, of a schizophrenic um, uh, do's and don'ts is like thinking money first. So think how you make money of your idea really early in time. Think about customers that are really willing to pay for something. So let's, let's put it this way. You have somebody who's interested in something um, and you present a product to them. You haven't built it yet, but you have to build it for them. And they say, yeah, it's interesting. Let's do a pilot. Um, try to make the person pay for the pilot. It doesn't have to be like the full ticket, uh, but uh, you need someone to actually make a transaction so you know, you validate that your idea is actually worth somebody paying for before you actually implement it. And then the other side is don't think money first because you want to change the world, right? So you want to make an impact and you don't want to make money driven. Otherwise, you could be a freelancer, you could, you could be a servicing company um, that makes transactions, so getting money for a certain service, um, but that shouldn't be, uh, I think, a motivation to follow. Um, so coming uh, soon to close, um, one thing that was important to us, but that was, um, I think, um, because we were bootstrapping, we wanted to keep our, um, our footprint, our money footprint low. So we wanted to keep expenses low. We did a lot of, on ourselves. Uh, um, for example, we do, do a lot of, of cloud servicing, uh, sorry, of, of services in the cloud, um, uh, and, and we kept that computing power, for example, really on, on its limits and stuff like this. So we actually made some effort to, to keep the cost low, to keep also the cost low in terms of personnel. Personnel is going to be your highest cost. Uh, and anyway, uh, also in, in, in specifically in Switzerland, so try to keep that low. Um, but don't be constrained with spending too little because that will slow you down. You have to find the right balance here to, of course, to put the money where it, uh, where it needs to be, but um, keep that in balance. Um, 
And the last thing is, um, uh, that was one of, of my experiences personally, is uh, make it, um, make a customer experience show uh, ideally like an MVP. You heard probably about it, like a minimum viable product. This is also why a hackathon is so important because you create something that's tangible that people can press, that people can touch and people can experience. And don't explain it. Don't create PowerPoints uh, because PowerPoints are much less... Uh, um, uh, are much less um, convincing than, than really like having a small, even incomplete, uh, even an incomplete uh, prototype. Um, there's a lot of more do's and don'ts, um, and uh, also there are some other lists from other companies, um, and uh, this came out of the top of my head, really, but um, because we evaluated a lot during the past year, so we basically try, try to keep track on what's going well and what's uh, going not so well, and then keep that also in, in, in do's and don'ts list in, in our minds. Um, thank you so much. Um, I hope this was interesting to you, and um, yeah, um, I think we're open for some questions, I guess. <laughs> So you were saying that there are differences between startups in the U.S. and startups in Switzerland. What are the differences? Um, so uh, yeah, first of all, um, uh, risk is uh, or capi risk capital is a much different thing. But everybody know, or many people know that. So when you go, as a, so we had a pitch in, in New York. Um, and um, after that picture were some investors and people, um, we had the term sheets prepared so it was very simple term sheets um, and there was one investor and he just signed a check of 100,000 like just like this um, and, uh, and getting 100,000 <laughs> in Switzerland or in, or in Europe is, is, is quite difficult so just getting risk capital is very difficult uh, in, terms of, uh, yeah, in terms of time and in terms of effort um, I think it's also part of the mechanics because in the U.S. you can just shine, sign a check. Here you have to think about it. You can go home. You have to make a transaction on the bank. You can think about it. So maybe it is also part of the game. Um, but uh, this was one of the most um, most interesting things. And then, of course, evaluation. So uh, the start been, uh, start been in the U.S. is uh, with uh, only one customer or two customers at the, at the time was valued in, in two digit millions <laughs> while in Europe uh, you're, you're in, a, in one digit million if at all uh. okay uh, are there signs that your startup is going to uh, fail like um, yeah are there are there signs you can from which you can project that your startups is going to fail you want to answer it because you have more startups. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I think the, the ones, the ones who. I mean, what the, the question is: What is a failure? For, for me, every every startup who who gets to break even, it doesn't have to be you know world winning. It has to be a worldwide activity. But it's it, as long as it's. Uh, going to break even, depend if it's only a one-person show, it's very small, but it's, it, you, you can at least make, make a living. Uh, if you're bigger, if you can make the living from uh, several employees, for me, that's already a success uh, in, in the same. So if the, the ones which I know, actually, in, uh, from ETA alumni, I think only about 10% have really, I would not say, if, not, they didn't go bankrupt, but they, at some point of time it became too cumbersome so that they, they had to be liquidated, so to speak. So you, you may, may get only part of the money that you put into uh, again back. And the main thing is, yeah, is really about probably what, what I said at the beginning. So you, you, you have a competency, you like what you do, and you go out and then you have a first customer, he pays for you like the freelancer job, and then w once it stops, then you think, yeah, so somebody, maybe you, have, you don't have a, a project for a couple of months, and then you go to the second. But you, you don't think about this pain and solution and how you can how you get into scalability, into a product, where you're gaining experience on this product and this becomes an asset and all the people around this becomes an asset and this is more and more valuable to the next customer, to the next customers. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to think about this, this matching of not just having, having a competence and selling it and having a first customer, but then or also what Ulf said, uh, listen to several customers so that you really have a, a product that, that can be scalable. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, I like this. Uh, I, it's very hard to, to, to estimate how it's failing because you start with a failing company, right? I mean, if you take investment, it's not a, it's not a, it's a defunct company because if you wouldn't have the investment, it would go bankrupt immediately. So it's very hard to, to say it from the beginning. Um, and I like this. Uh, I think this was Elon Musk, I think, I think said this. Uh, you always work on the uh, assumption that you're wrong and you try to be less wrong, right? So in terms of uh, development of the company. But I think one of the signs that, that uh, I would say is, yeah, like, like sales, if they dry out um, and if it doesn't scale as expected um, and, it, um, and you don't see um, the path to profitability anymore um, and you don't reach the milestone, milestone, well, reaching milestones is also difficult because um, sometimes you just set the wrong milestones. Um, But uh, yeah, I think uh, drying out, or if, if you don't reach that scale and, and way to profit, fro profitability is, is, is getting thinner, then, uh, then I would say, okay, maybe, you know, or, or there is nobody interested in the idea. I mean, uh, but that's something that you find out very early. Thank you. I guess this one is for the both of you. What is the personal price or sacrifice when doing a startup? My sacrifice, um, so um, uh, <laughs> that's a good question, actually, because we discussed it a lot. Uh, so, for example, my, my, my U.S. Uh, um, colleague, um, Davut in the U.S., uh, he put everything on, on one card. Like, he said, okay, I, I saved all my money, I'm, I'm, I'm taking all my money, I'm going to the U.S., I'm, I'm doing this startup. Uh, I don't have this uh, risk profile, so um, I would, um, if it cost me money, Uh, I would be very careful. So, because you invest a lot of time already, so time is your uh, is your investment, not the money. Um, and if if time and money comes together, it's gonna be existential. So, um, and then um, yeah, because yeah, you, you lose your time and you lose your money. So, uh, I think there I draw my line. <laughs> so I don't want to lose any money, but I can and I can lose some time. Yeah. Yeah, my, my sacrifice was my health. Uh, so I grew up to 120 kilo uh, at the point of time where I realized that, uh, you know, I didn't take care of myself mainly because it's not the family. I had enough time. I have a beautiful family, children and so on. But then it's, it's the company, it's the, it's the job, it's traveling a lot around and then the food is just, you know, it just has to be <laughs> somehow <laughs> and didn't really care. So I really, only after I sold the company, I could take care of my health. Yeah. I would be really interested in learning more about how a team evolves through time. Like, for example, you told us you started with one colleague and I guess then hiring a new person or adding someone else to the team like changes the whole dynamic, especially once you're really small. How did this, like impact what you were doing or what were the first people you had to hire what were they good at what did they help you with mm -hmm. well, maybe i can start first uh, the, the first company in, in convergence utility consultants i really i was actually not sure yet whether i'm ready to jump and then i was replying to a job offer And it was a, a small company, a, a subsidiary in Switzerland from a bigger consultancy in Germany. And then I felt, you know, immediately that the chemistry was excellent, you know, what we think, what we had several interviews around. And at the end I said, you know, I would very much like to work with you, but not for your company. <laughs> Or with you and not for that. And that's how, how, how we matched kind of, of this uh, kind of match. Maybe it wasn't deliberately, it, it, it happened uh, somehow. And then the first, uh, the first uh, employee, that was really a, a tough, a t a difficult because we, we felt you know because we are a no-name company we're so small why would ever anybody uh, uh, be interested to work with us and then after a while we realized that because we were small i mean obviously we're not a big brand and for a long time we will not be it huh? but interesting projects attracts uh, a lot of talent huh? And especially in a small team, you're much more visible. You are much closer to the customer. You are more part of a team and not, uh, not a, little, uh, a, lot, a little wheel in a big machinery. So that, that really helped us then to, to, to get to good people. And maybe also one advice, I was more risky versus not putting everything itself. So I was being told, why don't you get a 50% job? 
So I had a 50% job in the area where I wanted to work with uh, at low prices, but which covered my, my, my basic cost. And then I had time for the 50% other to really be put on my company. And it, I needed about one year in this situation. And afterwards, I had enough uh, projects to jump. Yeah. That's a kind of hedging strategy. Hello, I have one more general question. So when analyzing startups or analyzing like any kind of success in any fields, isn't it that we maybe put too much emphasis on the people who succeed and ignore the one who fail? That like this is like the typical case of the survivalship bias that like uh, the successful people always want to talk about it and no one wants to like be the loser and go and talk about it. So aren't we missing like some crucial information from the startups that fail? And shouldn't we put like as much focus on the failing ones as on the successful ones? Like for, like my idea is always like if I ask like the most successful people who make like millions in a day, it's like lottery win winners. And like there I don't want to take their advice. Mm -hmm. Like yeah, uh, I, I, it's, it's, okay. No, it, it, it's right. I mean, that's why I, I didn't invite Urs Hölzli, who speaks another time about Google huh? or, or Doodle or uh, Avalok. You have heard that Avalok has been sold uh, with 2.5 billion huh? exactly this week to NEC and, and so on. So th that's really the, the rare super, super successes. Huh? And I think, yes, there are also lessons learned from there, but I think in, in just the average entrepreneur, and yes, there are not so many failure. Huh? They are no more on the list. I mean, you're right, but I was talking also to all of them. Huh? What, it, what was interesting for me, it's, it's really only 10%, so that, that's also, uh, you know, I, that, that's something to motivate you. Huh? In average in Switzerland, it's more than 50% to fail. Uh, so that, that's also it's a signal that, that our knowledge in IT is, is needed in the market. Huh? And I also I felt, you know, if, if I'm going to fail, you know, you never know. But, but still there is a market and there is a job market and then I go, go back into jobs. So it's not, it, it's not a problem to, to, fail or to, to try. At least I have tried then. Huh? And, but the statistics show that, oh, that it's, really, it's really only few. And, and exactly what I mentioned, if you, if, if, if you focus, if, you have, if you're more focused on project delivery and forget about sales and have the sales funnel uh, constantly implemented because looking for new project is a, is a constant uh, activity that you have to do wherever you are. And uh, yeah, I, I think, and then also the entrepreneur, also the success, the most successful entrepreneurs, they told me we had many failures as well. Huh? I mean, it looks, and obviously in the TV show, we only say, speak about our successes, but all the don'ts, I mean, believe me, all the don'ts, is a, they learned the don'ts very painfully. Huh? And uh, yeah. Yeah, I, think I sympathize a lot with that question as well because um, often you don't uh, you don't actually see the beginning of that story. For example, like a company like now Beekeeper or something, you don't know how it started because you're only here in hindsight. Oh, wow, they made everything right, right? But uh, but you have to look really back to how it started and how how people were struggling in, in the beginning as well. Um, like uh, for example, as, again for us, uh, two cents, uh, the US startup. Uh, my colleague, he was living on on like these uh, essence marken on these uh, meal uh, you have meal uh, where you get you get instead of money you get uh, like these meal tickets something like this uh, because you didn't get any any money he, he and now it's in a seven digit uh, revenue stream right so so you don't see that it's only uh, in hindsight uh, it looks like all it's success but it's uh, it's a hard it's a hard uh, it's a real hard game uh, 